Welcome to this special session at FICI's 93rd Annual Convention, Convention, Inspired India, a session with Sri Anand Sharma, Honorable Member of Parliament and Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Rajya Sabha. Joining Mr. Anand Sharma are Mr. Uday Shankar, President-Elect FICI, And Dr. Jyotsna Suri, past president Fiki and chairperson and managing director, the Lalit Suri Hospitality Group. May I now invite Mr. Uday Shankar to welcome and moderate the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning and a very warm welcome to Honorable Mr. Anand Sharma, member of the parliament and deputy leader of the opposition in the Rajya Sabha. Dr. Jyotna Suri, distinguished guests, members of the media, and ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. I wanted to extend a quick warm welcome to Mr. Sharma, who is very well known to all of us here in this conversation. You know, Mr. Sharma has been one of the most distinguished members of parliament, a minister, veteran minister, and a very articulate advocate of the responsible partnership between industry and society. And that is why it gives me great pleasure to invite Mr. Sharma to come and speak to us. And in these times when we all could do with bipartisan advice from across the across the spectrum, that can't, I can't think of a better person than Mr. Sharma to talk about the issues that confront us and how best to resolve them in the best interest of the country and society. Thank you, sir. Over to you. Thank you, Uday. The President of Fiki, Sagita Arvedi, and President elect Uday Shankar, Yosna Suri, past presidents, captains of industry, friends, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to thank you all. I was happy when uh, Sangeeta Arvedi came to invite me for this AGM. I have been looking forward to engaging with you all because the country and the world is confronted with an extraordinary crisis, something that the world had not seen for over a century. Nobody could have anticipated the onset of this pandemic, which has created an enormous disruption across the globe and including in our own country. What is important for us to see is how we have been able to respond to it, manage it, there were countries before us who were impacted much more to begin with in Europe and thereafter the United States. And the lockdown were introduced even before the lockdown in India to break the chain and the community spread to check that. India also had to go in for that. It had become necessary. But what we saw was one of the most stringent lockdowns. Yes, it may be uh, a case that the numbers have kept on climbing, but nobody could have helped that has helped uh, help, help, uh, anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. But what it led to was was not only disruption, disruption, a shutdown of the economy, of the fallout. And particularly the poor and the vulnerable got social and economic got impacted as it happens in any society. India is a vast country, diverse country, India country, towns to work in the factories. We call them the migrant labor, about 140 million plus out of the conditions. Transport, trains, buses, buses, interstate movement, interstate movement, intercity information to respond. It's not only the government of India, but it's the state government, the district administration, the municipal administration who had to scramble to put in place the quarantine shelters to arrange for food and uh, other social security measures which they badly needed. But there were certain images 
which would stay in etched in our memory uh, of pregnant women, old men, women, children, trudging hundreds of kilometers to their villages. Perhaps their lessons learned how to handle a pandemic, which have to be handled geographically by the districts and subdivisions and the municipalities. And I hope that we put in place standard of procedures for future. We have also witnessed a major upheaval in our economy and a contraction. I'll not say that India is an exception. It has happened to other countries too. But if you look at the Q1 numbers uh, of 23.9, it was pretty high. But luckily, there has been a recovery. When we look at the second quarter, uh, and the numbers are 7.6, I am talking to those who are better informed than me about these numbers and what's happening to our economy. But one thing I have to say, despite the challenge, we, we were not overwhelmed. We responded with grit as a nation. When we look at where we were in March, the world was still learning, including the doctors and the medical fraternity, how this virus was behaving as scary as it is and continues to be. India was not thrown off balance, I would say. We have been up the learning curve very sharply. We ramped up our capacities. And there I would compliment the Indian industry, our entrepreneurs too, and our healthcare system. From the isolation beds, which were nearly 1,70,000 on the 1st of April, today we have almost 14 lakh isolation beds. The ICU beds, we have quadrupled from 20,000 to 80,000. And similarly, the tests from 28,000, we have gone to 1.5 million. And the number of labs, when you look at the testing labs, 125 in March 31st, and today 2,229 or maybe more. So this is uh, a credit to our people, to our society, to the government. So we all got together as a nation, as the people of India, uh, to respond to a situation which was beyond us. With, and equally, I would say that I'm proud that this country is today in a position not only to manufacture, but export ventilators, the PPE kits, the masks which are there. But yes, there was a recession in our economy even before the COVID pandemic. We were declining for six continuous quarters, and the last one was 3.1. But now, what we have seen due to this, there have been huge loss of jobs, incomes, daily wages. The urban poor perhaps uh, get ignored because they do not automatically get, get covered uh, by the social security net and the food security net. And that is what we have learned during this pandemic. And now uh, we have, in fact, a chair of parliamentary standing committee. We have discussed it in detail uh, the, uh, on home which because the pandemic management was with the Ministry of Home Affairs under the Epidemic Act, but the NDMA Act in particular. Now, there is need in this country to have a national database, particularly on the migrant labor and workers. And as I have mentioned, it has to be the, the location, the geography. Surely, we will come out better prepared and hope and pray that there is no pandemic in our lifetime again and in the lifetime of our children. But when we look at the industry per se, both organized and unorganized sectors have been affected. Huge loss of jobs. In organized sector, it's feared 10 million jobs may have been lost. And in unorganized sector, which employs 80% plus of our workforce, about 450 million Indians, the Job losses may be four crores plus. The hospitality sector, the aviation, has been worst affected because there is a multiplier effect there. These are labor intensive. They are also foreign exchange earners. And about 30%, that's the global average, and maybe in India, of the restaurants, sea trees, they have been shut for good. And it employs six crore people 
So we're talking about one and a half to two crore jobs lost there. When you get the recovery, it's a debatable issue whether it's a V-shaped recovery that we are witnessing or it is K-shaped because it's one part which is moving up and there's another part which is not moving up as of now. In the organized sector, we have to look, I was looking at the salaries uh, which go in the banks as bank deposits. The salaries below 25,000. Now, that, those deposits are down by 20%. So that is an area of concern which continues there. The migrant laborers have returned to the cities and towns post lockdown, but uh, job availability is much less and there's no demand for jobs, though the labor is available. The economy, as per the Reserve Bank, had gone into a consumption shock, but we saw a spurt in Q2. Uh, we hope it is sustained in the next two quarters, which is very important. There's, uh, it could have been the festive season, the pent-up demand, the inventories of the stocks which were there. Now, it is important those stocks are rebuilt. Uh, for this country and also what concerns me and I must be very frank in sharing is uh, the bank credit. The government has announced stimulus, many measures, most of them are uh, fiscal, credit related, interest subvention, but uh, it is not what is uh, claimed to be uh, over 10% or 15% of the GDP, it's barely 1.5% of our GDP, and the financial outgo is less. I personally feel that people, particularly the poor people, must have some money in their hands, as it has been done elsewhere by the governments. Then only the demand and the consumption will go up, and the factories will produce, and there'll be markets, there'll be consumers. So we need to be more generous. Uh, we need not look at this year, uh, which is uh, exceptional uh, for fiscal deficit numbers in the FRBM. Let's cross that. We'll have to breach the limit. Even if we have to go towards partial demonetization to give more stimulus, go to the industry, including wage support, guarantees, which government has done, but perhaps there is room to do more. And that's where I would urge uh, the Prime Minister and his government to do so. There are two concerns, or three rather. The capital expenditure is still very low. Private expenditure, but the government expenditure is low, which needs to be ramped up. We also have the concerns about uh, investment crisis next year and a banking crisis because the banks are losing their margins, interest margins, and all the, they are not making money even on the loans that have been given. So the government will have to go in for major capital infusion in the Indian banks. That is my uh, suggestion, I'll not say recommendation, uh, because banks need to be compensated. The government must recognize this problem too. Uh, I hope the finance minister is listening or some of you tell her. If I get an opportunity, I will do so. Because as of now, it appears the North Bloc is clueless about this crisis which we may face in the next financial year. Friends, we have lost 10% of our GDP, which is not small. It will take time for us to recover. We'll be lucky if we end up this year with the good performance in the next few months. But we'll be still down by low double digit, maybe 10%. So next year, what we do? Hopefully the vaccines will come. And we will be able to actually accelerate, press the pedal when it comes to our economy and industry and create a better year and a better future. But even if we grow at an extraordinary pace next year, 
we will go back in 2022 to where we were india's gdp in 2019-20 this is how big the challenge is so it has to be a inspired india a resilient india a confident india uh, which will be able to overcome uh, this challenge i was following the proceedings of the fiki agm the honorable prime minister had come other ministers and there was talk of reforms yes india has since 1991 embarked on the path of reforms fiscal reforms structural reforms it's a continuous process i am a votary of reforms what is important to bear in mind that our reforms have always been backed by a national consensus there has been a predictability there has been no reversal no u turns that gives confidence to our partner countries and to the investors i will say that during my time we opened up many sectors people need to be reminded we face opposition yes it happens in democracy the today's voters were over op uh, opposing what we were doing uh, when we were in government dr manmohan singh and me and other colleagues particularly when we opened up the retail sector the single brand retail 100% we went up to fdi the multi brand retail which created a huge huge uproar and controversy we opened up the aviation sector the defense sector today if we have marks and spencer and ikeas of the world uh, let me humbly take some credit that we put in place policies uh, which ensured that they come to our country But after 2014 when there has been a change in the government there have been many reforms if i have to name few the gst the ibc insolvency and bank eco the insurance bill now how they happened because congress party gave bipartisan support until 2018 no reforms could have taken place no bills would have been passed in rajya sabha because we had the numbers now our numbers have gone down but until then now i'll say that the government reached out to the opposition negotiated with us and we miss our friend and we think big reforms which went through today what we are seeing is a uh, turbulence some protest the issue is of farm loans question we must honestly ask why reforms must be participatory not arbitrary there must be stakeholders consultation we have a parliament we are a constitutional democracy there is a system of checks and balances we are parliamentary standing committee which provides a platform for stakeholders consultations legislative scrutiny there is inclusion and consensus which is created what is important is there would always be different views there will always be reservations but to find the middle ground to build a consensus nothing should be rushed through or done without building that consensus that results in what we are seeing agitation conflict and a loss of trust what worries me today is the binary of we versus you this is dangerous it should not happen in our country we all indians are patriots we will support all positive measures of the government opposition is there to flag issues but we are responsible citizens national interest is as important to us as to the government of the day there would always be constructive inputs critical inputs given and co cooperation but in a democracy when we have to oppose that's why we are called the opposition in any democracy uh, you need that 
there's a Sanskrit shaloka, Naikam Chakram Abhi Prabhayatam, that without uh, two wheels, even the chariot of the God does not move. So the chariot of democracy must have the government, but must also have a robust and effective opposition, but a responsible opposition. What are my advice to the government and my appeal to the government? Yes, in any agitation, sometimes there would be elements uh, who do not represent the mainstream. And it's here the farmers' unions. Let's not forget there, the farmers are the Andhavas. They made India self-reliant when it comes uh, to our food requirements. A food exporter, net exporter in the world today. We are very proud of them. And it is their sons who defend our frontiers. And that's why when we were challenged by two successive wars in the early 60s, our then Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri had given the slogan of Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan. I personally feel that through dialogue, everything can be resolved through negotiations, through persuasion. We have chief ministers of the states. They should be involved. And let's get over this crisis too as a nation together. I will say one thing. What is democracy and its essence? There will be different ideologies and different perceptions. But India is a rich bouquet, multilingual, multi-ethnic, multi-religious. India's strength is its unity in diversity. India's strength is in its institution, its constitution, and also secure citizens. As long as the citizens feel secure at their Fundamental rights would be respected. India will gallop forward. Nothing can stop this great country. But dialogue and for the government also to listen. We, it's, the word dialogue is important because if only I talk and I don't listen to you, then there will be a problem. हमारी परंपरा भारत की क्या रही चर्चा चिंतन वाद विवाद और संवाद सो देल बी चर्चा डिस्कशन चिंतन इज रिफ्लेक्शन एज यू नो देल बी वाद देल आल्सो बी विवाद देर मे बी डिस्प्यूट्स बट देन दे डिस्प्यूट्स एंड डिफरेंसेस मस्ट लीड टू संवाद दैट इज अ डायलॉग अगेन आई होप दैट वी विल ऑलवेज रिमेंबर दैट वी हैव रिसेंटली सीन elections in uh, a large democracy and a major power of the world in the United States of America. We saw the narrative too. Yes, it was bitter. That's how elections are. But once the election results are there, the institutions take charge. And slowly and slowly, people get over the acrimony and the bitterness of the elections. Here I would admire the American institutions too, the way their Supreme Court has been acting and functioning. India too also has our judiciary, which is independent, meant to be independent. But it has a constitutional mandate and a duty, the Supreme Court, to uphold the Constitution, to uphold the statutes. There are concerns when there are delays on important constitutional matters and the bucket is kicked down the road. There's an old saying, justice delayed is justice denied. When justice is to be done, when interventions are required, my urging would be that is the expectation, my lords, and they should do that because we all have faith, that faith must remain intact in our system that as a rule based and rule the world society. When we talk of future, where we go from here, I'm an optimist. The challenges will remain as we go forward to the 2020-21. But let's approach that with hope 
and optimism, leaving this NS horrible behind us. The pandemic and its management has taught us a lot. India has responded, as I said, with courage. We have learned, we have adapted, we have proved our resilience as it demonstrated our country as a whole, our capacity of scaling up our response, which I have referred to. You as captains of industry have a major role to play. I have faith in each one of you, our entrepreneurs and our institutions, that together we will be there. It's not when we say that I am from the opposition, we were in the government once. So once the elections are over, it is the government of India. I want to make that absolutely clear. So after whether 2014 or 2019, the government which has used office is elected by the people. So it's the government of India. It's not the BJP's government. Yes, BJP is the ruling party. And for that matter, Prime Minister Shri Narendra Modi is the Prime Minister of all the people of India. So every citizen, therefore, has a right to appeal to their government, to give their suggestion. And it's for the government of the day to accept or otherwise. I wish each one of you a very happy new year and to your families. We hope that we will be able to build together an India which remains inspired and confident. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharma, for that really, really positive and constructive talk to us. May I now request Dr. Jyotsna Suri to propose a word of thanks. Thank you there. Uh, Adam Sharma ji, Honorable Member of Parliament and Deputy Leader of Opposition in Rajya Sabha, thank you for your time and gracious presence. Uh, you have a very long association with FIKI, be it uh, through your tenure as a parliamentarian, be it in the ruling party or in the opposition, and FIKI is very appreciative of it. As you very rightly mentioned, you know, the unprecedented turmoil as cre uh, by created by COVID-19 has shaken life and economies across the world. India, as you are rightly mentioned again, has demonstrated its strength in dealing with the crisis, be it the timely lockdowns, production of masks and PPE kits, handling the healthcare, and now on the verge of uh, producing a safe and cost-effective uh, vaccine, not only for its own citizens, but of course, for the citizens of the world. Thank you, Anandji for sharing your valuable views with the industry on how our inspired India can emerge as a strong, vibrant economy. Thank you, President-elect Mr. Uday Shankar for your opening remarks. I wish you good luck for your forthcoming tenure and we are all looking forward to your leadership. Thank you, Team Fiki, for putting together this entire uh, show. Uh, and of course, all of you who have logged in for this session. And as the year comes to a close, let me take this opportunity on wishing all of you a happier, healthier, and more peaceful 2021. Stay safe, stay healthy. Namaskar. Thank you.